Brian, as you and I have talked about off air, and for those of you that are already joined us, you already know where we're going today. Are we going to talk politics? No, not exactly. Are we going to talk about the election and how it's going to affect our industry? One million percent. That's the only thing to discuss today. And so, Brian, I just want to go down two paths today. One is what the hell happens if Trump wins? Number two is what the hell happens if Biden wins? Let's start with the incumbent because it'll probably be less potential change. What do you foresee happening to real estate, mortgage, and the real estate industry if Trump wins again? Well, from a broad scope, I think it was Duma who said, um, democracy is doomed to fail because eventually the masses will understand that they can vote the treasury. And I think we see a lot of that going on right now. And as we just spoke about a couple of seconds ago, I think it's really important for people to vote on their propositions locally and their local elected officials. And that's how you can really affect change. And I'll tell you this right now, um, if you don't understand the propositions, do us all a favor and don't vote. Like, just don't do it. Be an informed voter, go out there, find out what your propositions are, establish an opinion, and then vote and do so in a manner that is informed. That's kind of what I think personally. Now, if Trump wins, this one's really kind of simple. So when it affects real estate, um, Trump is a, a hands-off, laissez-faire type of president in terms of getting rid of um, you know, things that are in our way, um, uh, you know, just uh, trying to get rid of different compliance issues that affect mortgages and affect real estate. So he's going to open the whole thing up and it's gonna be a hell of a lot easier for people to buy and sell real estate, particularly when it comes to the mortgage aspect or component of this whole thing. That's the big thing is how can I borrow somebody else's money and how many roadblocks are in the way between me and that other person's money? With Trump, you're gonna have fewer roadblocks, money will be cheaper, money will be easier. And so we say off the cuff that that's really a good thing. On the flip side of it, however, is what we're starting to see in the mortgage industry, and I bet you can say this too, is we're, we're starting to find people who are running fast and loose in our industry and they're doing things that remind me of 2004 and 5. If Biden wins, they're going to be much more, there's going to be a much more compliant approach to the mortgage industry. We're going to rein things in a little bit, but I'll bet you most mortgage people would say, you know what, maybe we need a little bit of that right now. I mean, we certainly do. So Trump is going to make sure that things are wide open, but you're going to find those bad apples who are riding loans and running fast and loose in this industry. And that really could lead to people getting loans, frankly, who maybe shouldn't necessarily have those. And we're seeing this with like the Alt-A market, the alternative doc, the, the Alt-A market. The, the, well, they don't call it subprime anymore, but it's essentially the subprime market. Uh, Biden, like I said, he's going to tighten things up right now. So, now, so here, here. Uh, but I do have a question. So before we get into Biden, the, you know, so let's talk about what has happened this year, which is obviously Trump is in presidency. And obviously rates are at, at, a, at the bottom of the barrel, right? And- um, if you recall correctly, four years ago, uh, when Trump won the election, rates shot up by about a point in 60 days. And a lot of that was because of the stock market rallying and whatnot. Right. So do we do you foresee that potentially happening again? Because that is important for real estate professionals to know, because if, if Trump wins again and it shoots rates up, that slows down the market in a big way. Well, I mean, the whole idea is, is Trump is a much more business friendly president than what Biden would be. So Trump winning would probably have an effect on the stock market. And when people put money in the stock market, they pull it out of the bond market. OK, so if I'm concerned about the direction of the economy, I'm going to put my money into bonds, which is a much more secure place to be. But when I put my money into bonds or mortgage backed securities, it's going to pull interest rates down. If I think that things are going to uh, start to speed up and everything's going to get better, I'm going to pull my money out of the secure, safe bond market and throw out the stock market. And when we pull money out of the bond market, then rates are going to go up. But here's the whole point. Are rates going up necessarily a bad thing? And the answer is really no. The bigger question that we have to have is, is they're stalling this whole stimulus package that we have right now, which is going to be about a, a trillion and a half dollars, a trillion and a half dollars. It, it, it's unbelievable. I've said this before. A billion seconds is 37 years. A trillion seconds is 37,000 years. That's the difference between the two. And in 2008, we were talking about billions. Now we're talking about trillions. 
But that money is going to come after the election and it's being stalled right now. But really what it comes down to is, are we just propping our economy up? And is there, are we living in a house of cards right now? You know, uh, because how, how many times can we add, you know, nine zeros to our balance sheet in this country? And we, in 2008, we were talking about billions. Now we're talking about trillions. We are inevitably going to get another stimulus package. It's going to help people out. But when we're talking about like a second wave of this uh, coronavirus and here in Vacaville, California, we're, we're shutting everything down again. So how long can we go ahead and keep our economy completely stagnated? Because what's eventually going to happen is people who are not working are not going to be able to buy houses. And if rates are up or down, it really doesn't matter a whole bunch. You know, Which, I, it, but you bring up a good point. And so the rates are low, not because of Trump's administration. Rates no. are low because of COVID, right? They're, they're low because they're trying to stimulate the economy. Absolutely. But you just brought up a, a good point, and I guess we can segue over to this. You know, there's always those 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 rumblings that if Biden wins the presidency, he's going to shut the country down. Now, I think that's over the top and people being over dramatic. But at the same token, uh, there's no denying that COVID numbers are up right now. But I believe COVID numbers are up because most of the country is just tired of being stuck at home. Kids are back in school at many in many areas, and and those kind of things are causing the numbers to go. I, I swear to you, and Brian, I think you and I have talked about this. The country is just not saying it, but their strategy with COVID now is just let's let it run its course. They're just not saying it, but their actions are proving it. Other than like you said, some communities are starting to shut back down again. With all of that said, do you believe that if either one wins the presidency, we're going to see dramatic measures? Um, in the real estate industry? Well, he, so I just read a study from the National Association of Realtors that said 37, 37% of people who are considering selling their house are not selling their house because of the epidemic that we're in right now. 37%. So imagine, yeah. So imagine a world where we had 37% more inventory. So for lenders, we've been able to get by on, you know, this refinance boom. And it, it is really plucking the low hanging fruit. And it's all over the place right now. That's going to end eventually because it, get this. If you have a rate of seven percent, you go to six refi market, six to five refi market, five to four, four to three, three to two. We are at the bottom. We have literally painted ourselves in a corner with people who are getting rates in the mid twos. Mm -hmm. Like you really can't go down from there. No. Now, that has helped lenders, real estate agents. In most markets, people are making these mass migrations from metro areas out to the suburbs. We're seeing it. And I, frankly, I think this is something that's going to be permanent. I think more people are going to continue to move out from metro areas and go to the suburbs because your house becomes your safe place. So there's an enormous amount of people who want to buy houses because generally when you go from a metro area to the suburbs, you're going from a high cost to a lower cost area. And that's going to boost the prices in the lower cost suburbs rather than in like a downtown area like San Francisco, LA, New York, Chicago. I mean, pick, pick the one that you want. So that's probably going to continue to go down. The issue that we're all having right now is inventory. So I know that new home construction right now is better than it's been in nearly a decade. However, we're still below a longer term standard in terms of new house construction that's going on right now but active existing property inventory is so incredibly low right now that even though a lot of real estate agents have buyers and sellers, or excuse me, they have buyers right now, we don't have the inventory to go ahead and um, fulfill what people are looking for in terms of their purchasing prowess. You know, Frank, my business partner, he, uh, he, his mom's been a real estate agent for 50 years. And one of these days, we gotta get Annie Vogelpool on one of these calls. She's like almost 90 years old and she is the sharpest damn person I've ever met in my entire life. And she's got a whole life of real estate. But here's the whole point is that we can have these buyers right now, but the problem is we don't have the inventory. And Frank went out and showed a house with his mom. Uh, and it was in Vallejo, California. If you don't know Vallejo, California, it is the largest city in the state, or excuse me, it's the largest city in the entire United States that actually went bankrupt. We got that going for us. So, he showed a house that was listed for like, I don't know, $380,000. He put an offer in at $420,000 and they didn't get it. There were that many offers on it. Wow. So the issue that we're going to have going forward is, and we've said this before, and we're going to kick this dead horse one more time. 
We have to get those people who are considering selling their houses but don't understand the market. We need them to list their homes because the issue we're going to be dealing with in 2021 from a real estate standpoint is going to be a lack of inventory. It's it, it we all see it, you know, I'm telling you what the weather is outside. All you have to do is go outside and look at the weather. We all understand this, but if you want to look at the highest and best use of a real estate agent right now and every agent wants to be a listing agent, the highest and best use of your time right now would be to go out and find those people who are considering listing their homes but aren't doing it because they don't understand what the market is and start to compel them. As a real estate agent, you are a salesperson. First and foremost, you're a salesperson. Your job is to compel people to make decisions that are going to be in their best interest. And when you have an entry-level house right now that's pre-existing, you're thinking about selling it, we are at the top of the market. And you're going to be buying into a softer market with that move up home. So yes, with rates being 2.5% right now and being able to sell that house, put a down payment on that move up home, possibly putting 20% down, getting out of mortgage insurance. Hell, you could probably find people who can move to that, uh, excuse me, who could go to that move up home and not have a difference in terms of their payment. And here's my last point on this one. If I drove a Volkswagen and somebody said I could have a Porsche for the same price of that Volkswagen, I'm driving a Porsche tomorrow. And if you have an entry level home right now and you can get to that move up home with those beautiful granite countertops and do it for the same price as your entry level home based on rates and based on losing your MI, everybody would do it every single moment of the day. Real estate agents should be looking at people right now who have those, you know, 1,800 square foot, three, two homes uh, where they've been in the house for at least three years. So they have a certain level of equity on this. And I would dial for dollars on that. I would dial all day long because every time you get one, you're going to be getting a commission between two to 3% on that. So these are $10,000 phone calls. This is what I'd be doing as a real estate agent right now. That's what you would be doing. I totally sorry. I thought, sorry. I thought you were going to continue. Okay. Oh, so, wow. and, and I agree. You and I have talked about this till we're blue in the face. I mean, if you, have, if you have not listened to either of us over the last two or three months, we've been talking about the strategy that you should be taking as a real estate agent. And I, I don't even want to go down that path. I don't want to continue to go down that path, but, but Brian is hundred percent, right? Like you have an opportunity and Brian, I'm afraid that a lot of people, a lot of agents aren't taking advantage of it, but let's stay on topic here. Let's okay. talk about what happens. So again, let's let's go back. Let me just recap real quick. Typically, over the last multiple elections, when an incumbent wins, there's typically very little change because policy stays about the same. Now, COVID's going to throw a wrinkle into that, but that's what you could expect if Trump wins. It's probably going to be status quo for the foreseeable future, and of course, COVID's going to impact that and probably keep rates low. Now, what happens if a Democrat, Biden, gets into office, what do you see happening to the real estate world? One word, regulation, is going to come back. It's not, going, it's not going to be a ripple, as you just said. It's going to be a tsunami. It's going to absolutely be overwhelming, catastrophic, and stifling. That's what's going to happen. Again, I always look at things from the context of the mortgage point, because people, everybody can fall in love with a house. Borrowing somebody else's money is where things become a little bit dicey, okay? And every real estate agent knows that most people have to go borrow somebody else's money. Regulation is going to come back in a big way. Understand this. Elizabeth Warren, our, our senator out of Massachusetts, she was the first head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Now, she didn't hold that post for too long, and then Richard Cordray came in, and we had this thing called policy through punishment. So lenders didn't know what they could or could not do based on the ambiguous nature of a lot of the regulations that we're following right now. We understood what we could or could not do when somebody got sued to the tune of $10 billion. Oh, I guess we can't do that. Now, Elizabeth Warren sees the CFPB as her, her baby. She really honestly does. And what they're already talking about right now is having Elizabeth Warren or somebody like her going into the post of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and bringing back regulation. Bringing back regulation is going to take liquidity out of the market. That, that's just what's going to happen. We're going to find fewer loans, and they're going to be more expensive. Now, I'm not trying to be partisan about this. I'm not trying to say go vote for Trump because we want less regulations because there's certain things about, you know, an Elizabeth Warren run CFPB that I do kind of agree with. I think we're running fast and loose right now in certain segments of the mortgage market. Um, but the overwhelming drive of that is going to be less money. Now, again, let's go back to what we said a couple of moments ago. 
you have rates that go from seven to six, six to five, five to four, four to three, that whole thing. We are at the bottom right now. So you're not going to find another refinance market. And with property values going up as much as they have in every major metropolitan area in the entire country, um, if we have rates go from two to four and a half, it's going to absolutely shut down real estate. It's going to. The only reason people can afford houses right now is because of the incredibly low interest rates. If we have Joe Biden win, he's going to put Elizabeth Warren or somebody like Elizabeth Warren at the head of the CFPB. We're going to take liquidity out of the mortgage market. Rates are going to go up. And we are going to see a lot of people who today, right now, can actually afford to buy a house, not being able to buy a house tomorrow. And I, I'm not trying to be a fear monger about this. Vote for whoever you want to vote for, because there's a whole bunch of things that are on the table. But when it comes to real estate and mortgage lending, a Biden administration is going to pull liquidity, money, and, and opportunity off the table. Now, let me play devil's advocate here, uh, because there is no bias here from either one of us. We're just kind of giving it to you what we think is going to happen, regardless of, of who we're voting for. Um, but you know, this is what I always say about elections, because every single election since I've been an adult, I've always found it kind of fascinating and humorous. And I'm sure there's somebody that's going to watch or listen to this that's going to have that passion. There's always those passionate people that say, if Clinton is president, the country's going to shut down. If Obama's president, the country's going to Bush is president, the country's going to shut. We're screwed. Every single election and every single four year ter term comes and eh, we just kind of muddy a lot, like nothing really dramatic happens, uh, you know, other than war, uh, which I'm not sure if that's necessarily the president's fault. Uh, but do you really think, because what you just said to me is telling me that if Biden wins the election, like shit's going to hit the fan on November 4th? It is. Yeah, I do. And by the way, doesn't this election feel different? than other by, by the by the way january 1st i guess he doesn't actually take the office until january but i mean 2nd. but doesn't but doesn't this election cycle feel different than other ones that we've gone through it was always kind of like yeah whatever i get you but never have we seen such a massive divide in terms of policy and we we in fact do have that right now and when you consider that the united states housing market is nearly 20 percent of our gross domestic product i mean yeah this is a big one and and there are two very, very opposite views of this whole thing. I know I've said this on here before, but it was interesting when Richard Cordray was running the CFPB, he, he took $250 billion from the treasury to run this new bureau that was put together. When Mulvaney took over at the CFPB, he took absolutely no money whatsoever. So we have a divide of 250 billion and no money whatsoever. It's a huge divide. And that is a, a different outlook in terms of what government should be doing in terms of policy in the housing industry. It's absolutely massive. Again, like I said, when I preface this whole thing, I said, you know, I, when I was a kid, I was, I was like 13, 14 years old and I was, you know, down working on a Ronald Reagan selection. So I've been following this stuff now for the better part of 30 years and I'm something of a history buff. So I've been looking at elections for a long time and I can't remember the last time that we had such a massive divide in terms of policy in this country between these two uh, candidates. And again, I, I listen, what I'm not telling you is I don't have the answer. I don't know who's going to be a better president. Um, but I do know there's a massive difference in terms of how they're going to how they're going to affect housing. It's sure. big. Sure. So, so, uh, and, and again, I'm playing kind of devil's advocate again. Uh, I've been in this business 20 plus years going on my 21st year. And I think that my success is a direct correlation to my effort and, and what I, what I put into my business. Uh, I don't think that a president has had a massive impact on my success or failure. Uh, sure, does the economy affect it? Do rates affect it? Yes, but the, life goes on. Uh, it's not like real estate's going to shut down if one guy wins and one guy loses. Um, so here I am again, kind of playing that devil's advocate of saying, is it really going to be that bad? And you, I, you're saying yes. You're saying that things are going to shift, but there's always some positive. Okay, I'll let you. I'll let you. But there's always some positives because here's what I think: if Biden wins the presidency, you're basically just getting a repeat of Obama's presidency, in my opinion. Uh, that's what I think is going to happen. Uh, but go ahead, timeout. You you call the timeout. Give it to me. 
no, no, no. You, you, you bring up like the, the real seminal point in this conversation. You really did. Um, we can't individually affect what's going to happen with the economy on a macro level at large. We can't do that. The only thing that we can affect is our effort. And I forget who said it. It was something to the, uh, uh, something like, uh, I don't know if there's anything about luck. I just know the harder I work, the luckier I get. Mm -hmm. And for a real estate agent right now or a lender right now, um, you can carve out a great living right now. It doesn't matter who becomes president. Now, I'll tell you the story. Can I, I'm going to go in the weeds on this. Can you give me a couple of seconds? Go for it. So in 2007, now my kids are older, okay? They're older, older, older. And then all of a sudden, I found out that I was going to have this miracle baby. You know, I've been married for 25 years. I just celebrated my 25th anniversary. And I got a daughter who's 10 years younger than my older kids. Yeah, sounds and like And this was in 2008. And I said, oh, shit. What am I going to do? This is when the housing market took a downturn. And I did think about it. And by the way, this is how we got into Think Big, Work Small. And the whole thing started with our videos is I started thinking, well, I'm not going to be a teacher, though I have a degree. There's not enough money in it, frankly. No offense. Um, I'm not going to go drive a truck. I'm not going to frame a house. I'm a lender. I'm going to lend. I'm going to find a way to make this work. And I remember thinking in 2008, if only we can get through this year, everything's going to be okay. Nobody told me it was going to last for three years, but I did this because I found out that I was having a child and damn it, I was going to make things work. In 2009, as a mortgage lender, I made more money than I ever made. And this was in the worst economy ever. So what I did was I got on my horse and I started riding that sucker as hard as I possibly could. So the moral to the story here is as a real estate agent or a lender, if you want to put your foot down because you have something that's driving you and you want to carve out a very successful business, it doesn't matter what the economy looks like. It doesn't matter what housing looks like because people are always going to buy houses and borrow somebody else's money. And all you have to do, if we're going to like distill this down to its most concentrated form, you just have to find more people to use you than somebody else. It's really that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, here's what we have going for us. And I'm, I don't mean to knock anybody in this industry, but your average real estate agent and lender, they have a, a marketing philosophy that I call dumb luck. So as a real estate agent, I'll get my license and I'll bump into my sister-in-law or my neighbor over here or the mom who goes to soccer with me every day when I take my kids there and I list their house and I say, well, I'm a really great marketer. No, you're not. That's dumb luck. There are great agents out there who systematically approach their business they make their calls, they look at their analytics, and they will always get a bigger piece of the pie. So as an agent, as we're talking about like what's going on with the election, if Biden wins, if Trump wins, we're looking at things from a 30,000 foot view, a macro approach to things. But you as an agent need to look at things from a micro approach. How can you affect your industry? How can you affect your income? And your micro approach will always trump the macro approach. So if you choose to work hard, none of this matters. If you choose not to work hard, none of this matters. It really comes down to how you approach your business and you have to approach it like a business, very systematically, very calculated and understand what you're doing, why you're doing, why you're doing what you're doing. And then really kind of measure your analytics and see if you're succeeding, meeting or failing what your expectations are. I love it, man. I love it. it. It's ironic. We just got off a sales meeting. So we just had a sales meeting with our entire group, 70 something people, where we are changing our policy on rushes uh, to limit the amount of rushes because what we found is, is rushes are a result of shitty work, like people doing a bad job at their job, loan officers specifically. And this applies to real estate as well. And the message was very simple. Like you better be better because if you're not going to be better, like stop blaming operational people. Stop blaming your lender. Stop blaming your title company. Stop blaming everybody else. There's this thing in your bathroom. It's called a mirror. You know, might all, you might have one in your bedroom too. Look in it because that's the reality. And, and Brian, you and I just jumped off, jump on a big time soapbox, which is this doesn't matter who the president is like successful people will continue to be successful. And so will you if you work hard. But if you're that person who just sits there and says, damn it, because so-and-so is in office, my business tanked. Come on, man or, or woman. It's not because of anybody else. It's because of you. 
And I appreciate Bonita has just been chiming in and, and thank you, Bonita, for doing that. First of all, she corrected me. The president takes office January 21st. I'm clearly not into politics. Otherwise, I would have known that <laughs> off the top of my head. But um, it, this is the truth, Brian. And I think this is a great, uh, great kind of finish to this. Uh, and I'm going to let you, you know, kind of have your, your finish as well. But the truth is, it doesn't matter. There's, it, it's going to impact the world. It's going to impact rates. It's going to impact, uh, you know, inventory. But it doesn't have to impact your business. That's the key. Yeah, you know, and and I get where you're coming from. This our conversation right now is becoming a little soapboxy. I mean, I understand that. It's, it's politics, easy. man. It's politics. It, what do you expect? It, it is easier said than done. It is. But I, I do know if you do, rather than say that things are going to work out better for you. You know, I just uh, me and Frank were talking about this. I was just down in Houston for the past couple of days, and me and Frank were BSing on the way back. And it, you know, it's like, you know, I just I find when I pick up my phone more often, more good stuff happens. I don't always necessarily know where it's going to go, but I do know that my opportunities grow when I'm constantly in communication with other people. The more I communicate, the luckier I get. So as an agent, you know, here, here, here's the whole thing. You know, the whole call reluctance thing is I understand that it's hard to call if you don't feel you have a reason, but a lot of the, a lot of the people that you sold homes to in the past, again, you know, if we're looking at, you know, north of 30% who are considering selling their homes, but they're not doing it because of a belief that's not true, that's an opportunity for you to, to um, you know, have that conversation and compel them into what's going to be a good decision for them. Maybe you don't even have that conversation. And in fact, if you call somebody, do this. Just call them without any kind of preconceived idea of what you're going to do. Just call them and say, how the hell are you? That's a great place to start. And when you pick up your phone on a much more regular basis, I guarantee you there's a six-figure income on the other side of that. And all you're going to do is talk to people who are looking to understand what's going on with real estate. Just have the conversation. It's, it, it's, just, uh, it's, it's so unbelievably simple and yet so difficult to do in the same breath. You know, I was sitting down this weekend and I was going through every genre of music. I'm like, okay, what's the best in this? What's the best in this? What's the best in this? in terms of different types of music and who I like. And I'm like, oh, I could go rip all these videos from YouTube and I could put them together and I could make this really fantastic video. And I think it would be fun to do because it would be an exercise in terms of what I like musically. And then I said, you know what? Football's on screw it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. But wouldn't it have been better if I said, you know what? I could still watch the game, but I could go through this exercise, which was going to be something that I saw as arduous and difficult. Yeah. Now, that's what kills people who are in sales, real estate agents and lenders. What we have to do is not say screw it, and we actually have to start doing the things that we all know that are in our best interest. Mm -hmm. It's going to the gym. It's reading a book. It's picking up your phone. These things aren't easy, and we know it statistically because all you have to do is look at all the people in real estate and lending who are not meeting their professional goals. And it's an overwhelming number. We need to be the different person who's going to change those habits, which are so ingrained in us and start doing the things that we all know, which is in our best interest. Listen, man, I know if I eat broccoli more often and less pizza, it's going to work out well for Brian. However, sometimes the meat lover special is pretty damn good. That's right. That's right. In closing, folks, he said call reluctance. This also applies to video reluctance. It applies to social media visibility. It applies to going to network meetings, which I know are fewer and far between, which is why being visible is uh, more important now than ever. Uh, th list, listen, I mean, this is, I think this has been good because we're talking about doomsday on one side of the coin, uh, but also talking about doomsday is not going to impact your business if you don't let it. And um, Brian, this has been this has been good. This has been fun. Uh, our next conversation. Well, hopefully we have a result, which is very possible. We won't, by the way. Uh, yeah, this, you're right. this this result could take weeks um, to to actually finalize. So in two weeks, when we come back, we may not even know who president is yet. Um, and if that's the case, um, I have a feeling we'll be talking about it. If not, uh, I think we're going to have something to talk about as in terms of now what to expect. Um, as well as here we are leading into the uh, end of the year and into a new year. So it's time to start planning for that next year. So Brian, I think we've already kind of got an idea of what we're going to talk about next uh, in two weeks. Absolutely. So professionally and very metaphorically, your business needs more broccoli.
<laughs> Touche. That is correct. My friend, happy election day. Enjoy your week and you all do as well. Thanks for being on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, later.